Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed in this video uh, of the innkeeper uh, that, uh, that the innkeeper is, has a modern, you know, kind of uh, outfit. And I don't know if you noticed, but he reached up and, and turned on a light, right? <laughs> and, and then you have a knock at the door, and of course it's, it's Mary, Mary and Joseph. And they're very much in first century clothing. And, uh, and I love this uh, video by the skit guys. And it, and it seems to me the way that they were, uh, what they were suggesting is that it's as though the first century question is being brought to the 21st century uh, world. The question is, will we make room for Jesus? Uh, will we invite him in uh, into our lives? Uh, that, that seems to be the question. Will we invite him into our homes uh, this Christmas? Will we invite him into our community, into our world, into our lives? Okay? And uh, that's a good question uh, to ask. Um, and for me, it's as though the uh, innkeeper is provided a, a do-over, if you will. Um, it, it's almost as though he is given a, a second chance uh, to make a room, if you will, uh, this time around. Because uh, if, if, if you look at the story, and, you know, and you, we've all read it, the innkeeper is the protagonist of the Christmas story, right? I mean, he's the villain. He's one of the villains of the, of the Christmas story. Uh, he's right up there with, uh, with Herod the Great, if you will. I mean, he, he's, in our mind, he's the, he's the bad guy, you know. Why didn't he make room at his uh, establishment uh, for this couple? And it sort of reminded me of the, the story the, you know, that I read about uh, uh, at a church where they were going to have the Christmas play and they were uh, for children, and they were handing out parts for the Christmas play. This one boy, he wanted to play the part of Joseph, but when the parts were assigned, he was assigned uh, the role of the innkeeper. Now, who wants to play the role of the innkeeper? You know, yeah, well, it, it, you did, didn't you, Ricky? Uh, you know, and and uh, so you know, really, we think this is the the villain. He didn't want to play the part of the innkeeper. He wanted to play the part of Joseph, and so they went through all the rehearsals and everything. But the night of the production before the congregation. Uh, he decided that he was going to change the script a little bit. And so when Mary and Joseph showed up at his inn and knocked on the door, and he answered the door, he asked, what do, you, what do you need? And they said, please, sir, just a room, just a room for the night, if you will. And so the innkeeper, uh, this little guy, he looks at him, he says, man, we are awful full, but I've got room for you. Come on in, he said. Come on inside. And the guy playing the role of Joseph, uh, you know, he was really quick on his feet. He stepped up, he looked inside, and he backed up. He said, we're not going to stay in some dump like this. We're going to the barn. That's what he said. <laughs> you know, we want to rewrite it a little bit. But just, just imagine, if you will, as we enter into this story, just imagine if you had a Christmas do-over. Uh, what would it be? What would you do differently? What, what should you do differently this go around? What, what, what comes to mind? Maybe it's for the first time to make room for Jesus into your life. Because I'm going to tell you this, and this is sort of the, the motif that, that should be throughout this message. And that is Jesus is not an inconvenience. Jesus is the Lord. Amen? He's not an inconvenience. And we need to keep that in mind. So maybe it's that this is the time, this is the time that you will truly open up your heart and let him be Lord of your life. But, but let him examine, examine. Uh, and where, where, if you allowed him in, what, what, would he, what would you do over? What would change? Because if you're writing down in the, using the listening guide, write these two words, no room. No room. No room are the worst two words spoken at Christmas time. Whether they're spoken or unspoken, but, but demonstrated in our lives, in our behavior, 
When we make no room, those, that, those are the two worst words at Christmas time. And you see this then in verse 7 of chapter 2. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in claws uh, and placed him in a feed trough, a manger. You know, I didn't know what a manger was. I had some cute little thing in my mind. A manger is a feed trough uh, because there was no room at the end. There was no, no guest room available for them, see? And, uh, and so the innkeeper, though we don't know his name and we, we don't know who he was, the innkeeper in the Christmas story has been given a, a truly poor reputation, if you will, bad reputation. And the question is this, does he deserve a bad reputation? I think, mean, yes, Ricky. Ricky, when you play it, no. But anybody else, yes. The Christmas story is this. Uh, you know, that we're told in these first few verses that, well, in verse 1, that Caesar, uh, Augustus, wanted more tax money. And so, uh, so he issued a decree to go throughout his territory uh, that people would have to go to their hometown of birth and they would register there and so that they would know who was living and who needed to pay tax. So, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth. They needed to make their way to Bethlehem. They packed up what little belongings that they had and made their way. And, of course, what we know about Mary is that she was very much with child, you know. And, uh, and so they made that long journey uh, from Nazareth to, uh, to Bethlehem. And of course, we know what the Scripture says, how that, why that needed to happen. And it takes some time to get there, and they get there. And, uh, and the, they find that this little town of Bethlehem is swollen with people. I mean, there's a crowd of people, people from everywhere shown up to register in that small town. And, uh, and it may very well be that when they showed up and they knocked on the door of this particular inn, maybe any inn, if you would, any bed and breakfast uh, there in that little village, they, they would just come to the door and say, hey, I'm sorry, we're stacked three deep in here as it is. We, we don't have any room for you uh, going down the road. Don't, don't bother me. And so, you know, there could be a legitimate reason sending them on down. And so that's what, that's what we would think. But, but the question is, should he have done something different? I mean, when you think about the innkeeper, what we know is this is the town of Bethlehem. We know that he was a Jewish man. We know that he was a man of faith, that he would have grown up in a, in a, a faith environment, that he would have gone to the synagogue. He would have been trained in the Scripture. He would have known the Scripture, especially the Scripture that would have talked about the coming of the Messiah to be born in what town? <laughs> Bethlehem, right? Am I still correct on that? Y'all didn't say that with a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence. So in the town of Bethlehem, so it could he could have read Scripture and known that, you know. But you know what rule he really broke, what commanded the Scripture, was the law of hospitality. And we know that Mary was very much pregnant with, with this child, and that was obvious, you know. And it may have been that she was experiencing some, some labor contractions by that time, and so somebody comes to the door, maybe a number of somebodies comes to their door and they turn them away, got no room for you, and they broke the very law of hospitality. And what they did, they turned a blind eye. They said, I don't want to see it. I really don't have any room for you. Go on down the, room, go on down the road and bother somebody else. So it's kind of that sort of thinking that was going on. And to me, to me, in so many ways, this 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 particular person in the Christmas story resembles our culture more now than ever before. More now than ever before. You know, even when 20 years ago we were talking about the craziness of Christmas, we were talking about the challenges of our culture, we were talking about the things that we face and on, and, and don't, don't lose Christ, sight of Christ in Christmas. After all, he is the reason for the season. Been saying that now for about 25 years. Let's don't lose sight. But you know what's interesting is, is that 
Maybe it's not for us as believers, but we do know that more and more our culture is distancing itself from anything to do with Christ. I mean, it just, if you watch, I only have public television, you know, I've got like, I've got like seven channels, you know, and they're all the, anyway, but uh, I've got just public television. And uh, when, I, when I intentionally would surf through there, and, I, you know, just amazing. They're almost every sitcom, whatever commercials, whatever is out there, it's like no room, no, not, not for Christ. And that, that's interesting. Now, let's bring it to us because we are in some ways like the innkeeper, if you will. We're people of faith, men and women of faith. We're men and women who know the Scripture, who have, who have, uh, have heard this story. And the question is, are we going to make room for Jesus? Because if you're writing things down, you know, there, there are these common excuses that we, we need to be very much aware of. And, uh, and, and the first is the, the cultural excuse. We, we, we come, we, we get, we just caught up in the craziness. It's crazy out there. It's crazy out there. It's, I just, I, I didn't know, I just got caught up in the, uh, in the flow of all that, of all that crazy stuff. And, and, and you've said it and I've said it, right? And then there's the clutter excuse. Clutter excuse is, I am way too busy, way too busy for the, uh, uh, you know, for, for the, the, the kinds of things that we're, I don't have time. I don't even have time to worship. I don't have time for all that. It's just way too busy. And then there's sort of that cover-up excuse, cover-up. I just didn't know. If I'd known, I just didn't know. Now, who in this room doesn't know, right? But sometimes we just got to get, it's, I just didn't know. So, uh, you know, sometimes, like the innkeeper, we miss the real experience of Christmas joy because we don't make room. Now, we're talking about joy. We miss the real experience of Christmas joy simply because we're caught up in the craziness. We're way, way too busy. We've made no room for margin, you know, on the page of our lives. Or we just simply say, well, I, you know, we plead ignorance. I just didn't know. And we miss real Christmas joy because of it. In fact, it is very possible for us to lose our joy in the midst of all the stuff of Christmas. You just think about that. Isn't that possible? You believe that's possible? It is possible for us to, to miss out or to lose Christmas joy. And I couldn't help but, you know, revisit Jesus' words when he said, I have come that you might have the experience of joy in its fullness. We are to be full of the joy of Jesus. That is is the truth but what and what Margie was saying to the children is is absolutely true this joy comes in the experience of Christ of Christmas and and happens from the inside out we experience it from the inside out you know there's a difference between happiness and joy uh, we live in a time when people are in pursuit of happiness. They want happiness. But uh, we cannot be happy all of the time, can we? Some of you don't look very happy right now. <laughs> we, we can't be happy all of the time. Well, happiness uh, depends on what happens. You know, if, if, if circumstances are good, guess what? We're happy. If circumstances are not so good, guess what? We're unhappy. If they're bad, we're unhappy. But if you put your, if you, in fact, if you put your trust in happiness, then you'll become a victim of circumstance. I, I'll, I'll be happy if things are going good, see? But if you put your trust in the Lord, then your true joy and your life will never change. True joy will never change because the Lord God never changes. Amen? Happiness is cosmetic. 
I can put on a happy face for you all day long. You know, there's a little girl that, that uh, I think uh, she broke some record because she was able to keep a smile on her face for 10 hours straight, 10 hours, 17 minutes straight without breaking her smile. How about that? You know, I can't last that long. And, uh, but, but, you know, I, I'm glad that we can go longer than 10, minutes, uh, 10 hours and 17 minutes with, uh, with joy. Joy is like character deep inside of us. Happiness is based on outside circumstances. Joy comes from within. Happiness meets our surface needs. Joy meets our deepest needs. Happiness will disappear. Happiness will dissipate in times of suffering. But joy will often intensify in the midst of suffering. That's the reason why James uh, wrote, count it all joy when you face, find yourself facing various types of trials. You know that, that word various types, that word in the Greek is where we get the word polka dotted. Various polka dotted, all colors of, of trials, whatever it is that we face. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. How are we able to do that? Because we have Jesus in our hearts. So now I want to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with happiness. I like it when things, I like being happy. You know what I mean? I like happy things. I like ha happy days. But it's much better if happiness is rooted in joy. Amen? Isn't that great? Uh, and I believe that that's the, the correct flow of things, that happiness really does flow out of our deep-seated joy. You know, that we can lose our our. Uh, our joy because of, of the sinfulness of our lives. That's what David said. David in Psalm 51 had lost his joy, lost his joy. Now I know it was deep inside, but he wasn't where God wanted him to be. And this is what his prayer was. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Say that with me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Did y'all get that? I didn't say it here. Really but then, then listen to this. When he restores the joy of his salvation, David says this to the Lord, and I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. I love that. Uh, you know, joy can be restored. We can lose it. We, we, we like the, like the uh, Psalm 42, we are like the deer thirsting for God. We need that joy deep inside. We want to drink of God. And I want to tell you that joy is the is the uh, a, a proof that what we have is real inside us. Joy. Imagine being joyful in the midst of some trial. You imagine finding God's confidence in the midst of that. And when we're told in, in Psalm 100, we are to serve the Lord with gladness. And that's like joy. You can't see gladness without smiling. <laughs> some of you are still not smiling. Uh, you know, but, but it's, it's like that. Listen to this. Joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. You believe that? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy lifts the burden. Joy takes the pain. When you get weary in your body, in your mind, you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to praise the Lord. I don't know how it happens. It's a miracle. We break out and we begin to sing. We, we sort of sing before the Lord. And the joy floods into our soul and renews us and energizes our mind and our physical frame. We know that. How do we know that? We practice it. We put it into practice. We experience it time and time again. Well, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We need that. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking about how often we could be this time of year, you know. And it could be like that little preschooler that was uh, just last week with singing in their, in their preschool Christmas production uh, at First Baptist Church in Gulfway, Gulfway, Texas. And, uh, and the little preschoolers, they came up, the little babies, you know, just little babies, they, preschoolers, they came up onto the stage and, uh, and, and the place was full. And they came up onto the stage and, and, uh, and they began to sing. And this one little, little boy, little guy, he's a little guy, he began to cry, and he was crying. He was bellering. The whole time 
crying. These other kids, they're singing. They're singing their Christmas song. Singing, singing, singing all the way through. <laughs> and this little boy, he is crying, crying. Oh, he is totally unhappy. And then at the end of the song, it, he got quiet. And the, the leader, the lady that was leading the music, she turned to the congregation and said, believe it or not, that song was joy to the world. <laughs> the Lord has come. <laughs> joy to the world. Well, that's, the way, that's the way it is. And sometimes we're just not where God wants us to be in relationship with him. We lose our joy. Sometimes we can lose our joy in the midst of all this because we've lost our sense of priorities. We've lost our sense of priorities. And let me tell you, we, we, we lose focus when we lose track of what is really important to God. And when we lose what is really important to God, we lose our sense of priorities and we get caught up all in this. So, so how in the world can, can it happen? How, how can we experience? When we gain Christmas joy, and I want you to hear this, when we make room, when we make room for Jesus, when we make room in our living and in our giving, when we are changed and we, we, we make room for him. Now, let me just say it like this. It's like the, the, the innkeeper, if we can put it this way, the innkeeper missed the opportunity to experience real Christmas joy. We often can miss the experience of real Christmas joy, just simply saying no to the Lord. That, that's how it would happen. He missed out. But, but do we want real Christmas joy? Uh, do we really want to be able to sing out joy to the world? The Lord has come. He's come into my life. He came into my inn. He came into my house. He came into my family. He came into my community. He came into this situation. That's where real joy takes place. If we just let him come in, he's knocking. Right? Isn't that what Revelation 3.20 says? Behold, I stand at the door of your heart, of your life, of your church, of your circumstance, and not. If you let me come in, we'll have joyful meal together. That's what he promised. And I'll never leave you. That's a great word from the Lord. You know, I think about, I thought about the gifts of Operation Christmas Child. Man, all those boxes that came in, over 100 boxes that came in. And then, you know, how many thousands and thousands of boxes... They went out all over the world, and, and people prayed over this. We prayed over those boxes and went out because we know that when that child opens that box, whatever they receive, it's temporary. But if they receive the Christ of Christmas, it is eternal. And the giver, the giver of that gift has made room for Jesus and has made opportunity for Christmas joy for that child and for their own hearts. You know, I thought about the, the angel tree gifts. Man, you know, I was gone that certain. When I came back, everything, I, all the little angel emblems were gone. And then they, people began to bring, that, bring those up, and they just stacked up. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone out and delivered those gifts, gifts to those family of, of, a, of a, a husband or a wife that's incarcerated or both that's incarcerated. So here's a child maybe living with a grandparent, and then, and then a gift is given. I thought about that. Now, whatever they, whatever they receive, I mean, it was everything from bicycles to, I don't know what all it was they were given. It was just a whole lot of things, a lot of things I would like to have myself. I made my list, but it was, it, it was awesome. Whatever those children receive, we know that stuff wears out. We know that there's temporary happiness with that. But if they will receive the Christ of Christmas, that's eternal. And when we're making room for Jesus and those kinds of gifts, what we're doing is we're making room for him in our hearts and in that opportunity to lift up his name. I thought about that. Listen, if you're looking at your listening guide, there's, you know, we talked about some making room suggestions. There's just five suggestions on there. Listen, here's, here's the first one because we're trying to make room. And I just began this message by saying, uh, or, you know, just saying that we need to, how we can make room. If there was a do-over, what would it be? You know, what would it be? And what we, if we're making room, then we're saying Jesus is not an inconvenience. He's Lord. And he's to be Lord of our lives every year. And we can recommit ourselves to that. So uh, here's one. Put a special song in your heart. What song do you have? I'm not talking about, I saw, I saw Mommy kissing Ra uh, Santa Claus. I'm not talking about that, you know. That's a great song. You know, but uh, 
but I'm talking about what song of Christmas warms your heart? What, what child is this in, uh, in Mary's lap? Uh, whatever that song says. <laughs> Y'all sing it for me. That, that now is sleeping. Whatever it is, you know. It, 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 Mary's lap is, is sleeping. Yeah, that's it. You keep, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, but but it, that song tells us who, what, and why. If you look at that song, what child is it? Who, what, and why? Put a song in your heart it, this, this Christmas. You know, I, I don't care if it's George Strait singing Christmas song. I, I don't care who's singing it. Get the message of Christmas in your heart. Here's the second one. Ask God, put someone on your mind you can help financially. Now, some people are already doing it. Maybe most are doing it. How, what, maybe help financially. I mean, unexpected. Uh, somehow a, a need has come your way. What would that be? Let God lead you in that. Or consider giving a Christmas pardon to someone you've locked out of your life. You know, not like the, not like the lady that wrote, uh, wrote one <laughs> in response <laughs> sometime back. See, this is what she wrote. In spite, this was her pardon. In spite of the truly stinky things you've done to me, in a spirit of peace and goodwill, I'm extending <laughs> to you a most undeserved but magnanimous pardon. Now start living like you deserve it. Don't you love that? Sometimes it's like that's the way we feel. How about the fourth? Find a place for a quiet half hour of prayer where you're just focused on what God has done for us in coming into our world, into our dark place, into our lives of sin to save us. How about that? Or how about this one? Write a Christmas letter to someone. You ever gotten a letter, unexpected letter, where somebody took some time, I mean really took some time, some effort with much prayer and thought, and they wrote out a word that, that came from the Lord to you. And you open that up, and it is absolutely a word from God. A word from God. Imagine getting that for this time of year. So what we're saying is mend a quarrel. Dismiss suspicion. Tell someone, I love you. How about forgive someone who treated you wrong? Now, that doesn't sweep anything under the carpet. What it does is it says, I'm going to be different. I'm not going to be owned by anyone's undoing or wrong. That's what it means. Turn away wrath with a soft answer. Visit someone in a nursing home. Visit someone in the hospital. Visit someone you know no one else is going to see this year. How about that? And those are just some of the ideas. But I'm going to say this. Because we know him, because we know the reason for the season, because he is not an inconvenience, but because he is the Lord, do whatever you do in his name to his honor and to his glory. I couldn't help but, but, uh, but think through a story where joy resurfaced in a, in a way that brought God honor and glory in uh, Wakanda, Illinois. I've never been there, but I love the story. In fact, my wife and I watched a movie last year about this story. Uh, but uh, where that particular community had a tradition. Every year for 40 years, they displayed two large crosses, lit two large crosses and displayed them on their two water towers in their community. And that signaled for the community the coming of Christ and the coming of Christmas. They did that for every year for 40 years. But a man in a nearby town was offended, offended and thought that there needed to be a separation between church and state and brought a lawsuit uh, from the Atheists of America, you know, organization. And so the community, they rallied, they tried to fight it, but then they met together and they realized it, the money was just going to be so it was going to be so costly that that they decided to take the two crosses down a lady that attended the meeting it happened on Tuesday now her name was Rosemary she said that the meeting about the crosses was on Tuesday night when it was over we knew the crosses would have to come down but then her husband Chuck Chuck did something she wasn't expecting when they got home he went out to the closet in his shop and he began to build something he put some lights on it and it was a it was a, a large cross 
And he took that, lit it up with lights, and he placed it in the window at their home. Well, then a, a, a fellow named Wilt Shoemaker, who owned a, an appliance uh, business down on Main, Main Street, he drove by, he saw that. So he went and he made a, a cross display and he put it in the display window at his appliance store on Main Street. And then others began to take, take their cues from that and they went, whoa, this is awesome. And then, and then it wasn't long and crosses were appearing everywhere on houses, on antennas. Remember antennas? <laughs> Have to hang it on your satellite now, you know. Uh, you know, antennas, yard displays. They were hanging at trees, windows. Uh, they were all over, up and down Main, uh, Main Street, downtown. I mean, it's just like this. This lady named Joyce Mitchell, after driving around with her two children, six and nine years old, looking at all of the crosses that were lit up, she said this. She said, the media portrayed us as losing the fight, but we didn't lose. Two crosses were replaced with hundreds. Here's the statement. And God was glorified through it all. God was glorified. If we should learn anything, I know it. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know it. We got we to give him the glory, right? So, so here's the thing. What are we going to do? I know it's, it's crazy. It's busy. We got a lot on our mind. But how can we make room for Jesus? this year how about letting him be birth in your heart how about letting him be Lord over your circumstance how about letting him be your guide in some life-changing those simple life-changing experience that's what it's about and see much more than displaying a lit cross in the window we are displaying the light of Christ through our lives so that he might receive glory through all we do and say. Wouldn't it be terrible if we went this Christmas season and we hadn't made room or done anything in his name in a way that brought glory to him? No, we don't want that. We want to let this message, let his word soak deep in our hearts and our lives and let him be our Lord, our Savior. Let him guide us in what we need to do. What do you need to do to allow him uh, to be Lord? What, what if you made room in your life? What would he do?